evening is the general bishop of the Coptic Church in the United Kingdom, born in Cairo, Egypt. Bishop Angelos emigrated with his family to Australia. He spent his childhood and early life there, obtained his Bachelor of Arts degree in political science, philosophy, and sociology, and went on to postgraduate studies in law. He returned to Egypt in 1990 to join the monastery of St. Beshoi in Wadi El Natrun, where he was subsequently consecrated a monk by His Holiness Pope Shenouda III. Bishop Angelos served as papal secretary until 1995 when he was delegated to serve in the United Kingdom. Please join me in welcoming for the first time, I hope not the last time, to the Institute of Catholic Culture, His Grace Bishop Angelos. Thank you very much. Um, I didn't realize that my most difficult challenge today would be how to get to the podium from my seat. <laughs> so, uh, uh, um, we were, um, we've been in Washington today and speaking about Egypt and speaking in particular about the past period in Egypt and what's been happening, uh, the period of the Morsi presidency and leadership, and how that impacted the whole of Egypt. And I suppose I'm very thankful to the um, US government because it wanted us to make feel very much at home and create a backdrop and a context, and to make us feel like we were in the Morsi days of Egypt, Two things have happened today. The government shut down. <laughs> and I had a power cut in my hotel this morning. <laughs> Never let it be said that there is a difference between the East and the West. <laughs> Thank you for your invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a wonderful opportunity to be here in particular that uh, only a few months ago I accompanied uh, the new head of our church, His Holiness Pope Toadros II, who is the 117th successor of St. Mark the Apostle, on his historic visit to visit the head of the Roman Catholic Church, His Holiness Pope Francis in Rome. And it was a wonderful meeting at the Vatican that marked the 40th anniversary to the day of the signing of the Christological agreement between our churches by the late Pope Paul VI and the late Pope Shenouda III in 1971. And it's a wonderful opportunity for common witness and for an understanding that while history has divided us, there is that which binds us. There is the knowledge of the incarnate Word living within the Holy Trinity, we all confess, our sacraments, our common heritage, the fathers of the church, and there is so much else our contemporary common witness today. I know it's sometimes used as cliché, but what binds us and holds us together is well and truly greater than what divides us. And at this time, during which the world has so many conflicts and challenges. There is so much darkness. There are so many obstacles to a life of righteousness and truth. 
that we must honor the work that is done here in this place and the work that is done in so many other places around the world and that is to witness to the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ in this world. We are sent and we are called, all of us, each and every one of us. I am just called in a different way to a different purpose, but we are all called. And we are all called to be a light in the world that needs that light. God would not call us to a ministry that was futile and that God does not send us to a place in which we are not needed. And the fact that we are here in this world today together confessing a common Lord and understanding our common desire to reach his kingdom means that we all have a calling together to bring others to that understanding. Through our unity, because at the end of the day, the church is the body of Christ. And our Lord has promised us in the Gospel of St. John that there will be one day one flock to one shepherd. As we stand today, we are a divided flock. We are a fragmented body. But believing in what our Lord tells us and knowing that our God is a God who maintains his promises, we know that that promise will be realized in the fullness of time. Whether that fullness of time is in our lifetimes or beyond is not for us to judge, but we work towards it, that the heart of God may rejoice, the glory of God may be revealed, and the promise of God through our work may be fulfilled. In that context, I want to share a little bit about Egypt. I'm sure that everyone here knows what the word Coptic means. Coptic just means Egyptian. Many of you would deal with Roman, uh, with, with uh, Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, various other Orthodox churches. And Coptic just means Egyptian Orthodox. I was speaking to our friends here in Truro uh, two days ago. It's been such a long time, I can't remember when it was. But um, I was explaining to them that I don't take shortcuts when I explain what Coptic is. Because I was caught out once. I was driving to one of our parishes and I stopped at services to refuel my car. And a scruffily dressed gentleman with a rucksack and a sign pointing somewhere or other who was asking for a, for a ride um, looked across the forecourt to me and said, Good morning, Padre. And I said, Good morning. He said, so which church are you from? And I thought, too early in the day to go to through the... <laughs> as gracious a witness as I am, of course. <laughs> too early in the day to be going through the whole Greek, Russian, Byzantine explanation. So I'll, I'll take the easy route. I said, I'm Egyptian Orthodox. He said, oh, so you're Coptic. <laughs> I've never taken that shortcut again. <laughs> it turns out that lapsed theologians are, are, are hitchhikers these days. <laughs> so, I come to you from the Coptic Orthodox Church, Church of Alexandria. I was speaking um, at a conference in Bangalore in India last month. And I thoroughly confused the poor passport agent as I walked in. He was an Indian Catholic, looked up my passport and saw that I was born in Egypt. Looked at me and realized that I was a clergyman, probably Orthodox. Looked at the invitation papers and it said that I was a bishop. And so he called a supervisor over. Mind you, it doesn't usually happen to me looking like this and traveling on aircraft. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I 
I'll tell you a side joke when I finish this one. <laughs> so, he called his supervisor and he, he said, whispered something to him and the supervisor came over and said, um, Father, welcome to India. And I said, thank you very much. He said, so you, you're a bishop? And I said, yes. He said, so you're orthodox? And I said, yes. Christian? He said, yes. <laughs> he said, but are there Christians in Egypt? <laughs> and I said, yes, actually, we have the largest Christian gathering in the Middle East, in Egypt. We have, on our calculations, between 12 and 15 million Christians in Egypt. It is the largest Christian gathering in the Middle East. And the last real outpost of Christianity in the Middle East. 20 or 30 years ago, the Christian population in the Middle East made up 20% of the overall population. Today, even with the sizable Coptic presence, it makes up 5%. There has been an incredible drain from every country you can think of. <coughs> Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Palestinian territories, across the whole region. And that's why the presence of Egyptian Christians is so important. Because without it, we would have almost no Christians at all in the Middle East. And just one fact, that we as a church don't use the word diaspora, because diaspora is, means a, a huge exodus. A diaspora population is usually a sizable exodus from its own home <coughs> presence, indigenous place. 90% of Coptic Christians still live in Egypt. And by God's grace, they are staying there. God has a special relationship with Egypt. In Isaiah 19, we read, In that day will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar to the Lord at its border. So God has sanctified Egypt from the start. It was sanctified not because it was greater than any other nation, or better, but because Egypt became a place of refuge for the Lord himself. When the angel of the Lord spoke to Joseph in Matthew 2, he said, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. And they stayed in Egypt for just over two years. And they traveled through the whole country. It's incredible when you see the map of all the places covered by the Holy Family. By the Blessed Virgin, by St. Joseph, by the infant Christ. And they traveled through the whole country, stopping at almost every place until they left Egypt again. And they blessed the whole country. There are places until today where we know the Hodi family stopped. We have a cave in one of our monasteries in Asyut, in the midst of all the troubles at the moment, where the Hodi family actually spent time. And there is a chapel, there is an altar in that place until today where a liturgy is celebrated. The Eucharist is celebrated in that place. <coughs> so the bread of life descends where the incarnate word was over 2,000 years ago. And that is an incredible link. But it was also a place of refuge for others. For Abraham, Jacob, Jeroboam, Uriah, and of course, it was a place of refuge for the children of God, for the Israelites, at the time of famine. 
Egypt was such an influential place. It was such a place of blessing. But it was also a symbol of slavery, bondage, and idolatry. That's why in Isaiah 19.1 we read, Behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt. And the idols of Egypt will totter at his presence. The idols of Egypt will totter at his presence. That was a historical reality. But if we look throughout history, Egypt continued through various parts of that history to be a place of slavery, bondage, and idolatry. And none more than our contemporary history. Why is Egypt where it is today? It's because modern day slavery, modern day bondage, modern day idolatry still exist. Materialism, inequality, injustice, disproportionate wealth, religious discrimination and intolerance. All of these fall into one or more of those categories. All of these taint the land blessed by God. We start our calendar in the year 284 AD. So whenever you look at a Coptic calendar, it is the current date minus 284. And generally, I like to point out that people, it's not because Copt is slower than the rest of the world. <laughs> and so it takes us time to catch up. But because the year 284 was the beginning of the reign of Emperor Diocletian. And the reign of Emperor Diocletian marked the greatest wave of martyrdom that occurred in Egypt, where hundreds of thousands, if not millions, lost their lives for their faith. Whole villages, towns, cities were martyred. Men, women, children. Just because they were Christian. And within our history, we have developed and grown and existed within that, with this backdrop of religious persecution. The next wave of persecution came in the 7th century with the entry of Islam. Up to the end of the first millennium, Historians will tell us that Egypt was 80% Christian. By the beginning of the second millennium, because of the greater Islamization of Egypt, the greater Islamization of Egyptian culture, where you really couldn't be Egyptian and not be Muslim, our Coptic language was slowly removed from official um, certificates and documents. And the language as itself, as spoken, was banned. At one stage, those who spoke Coptic would have their tongue severed. People were given an ultimatum. They became Ahl al They were given dhimmi status, which meant that they were a second-class citizen who was protected by Islam upon the payment of a tax, of a jizya tax. And so people were given one of three options. You pay the tax and you maintain your faith. <coughs> you convert to Islam or you die. And so with that wave, we then found that the proportion dropped from 80 to 18. 
which is close to the proportion we still have to date. Egypt has always lived with martyrs. We didn't say what martyrdom is. It's part of our culture. Our new year, we call the Anno Martyri, the year of the martyr. And we just celebrated our new year in September because we still follow the pharaonic calendar that is transposed into our own lectionary. Tertullian said that the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. And that seed, planted in fertile ground, grows into a tree. And that tree brings forth fruit. And that fruit still exists in Egypt until today. St. Clement of Alexandria says that we call martyrdom perfection, not because the man comes to the end of his life as others, but because he has exhibited the perfect work of love. Those who have lost their lives for their faith, and those who continue to lose their lives for their faith, whether in Egypt or anywhere else, are those, in the words of St. Clement, who have exhibited the perfect work of love. For indeed, what greater love is there? Not only to lay down your life for your friend, but to lay down our lives for the knowledge of our Saviour. It sounds like a sad story, but it's not. I'm not here today to tell you that things are bad and, and uh, Egyptians or Christians are suffering and we're... Not at all. Actually, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church and the seed grows into a tree and the tree brings forth fruit. And we are seeing fruits today because our Lord promised us and he said, we will not leave us orphan. If we call upon him, he will come. Exodus 3, 7, 8. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. And I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up to the land, to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. If we look at the contemporary history of Egypt, there is no plausible, logical reason for Christians to still be existing there. Demographically, it doesn't work. How do you have such a sizable Christian presence in an Islamic state within an inflamed Islamic region that through radicalization is becoming more and more intolerant not only of Christians but even of Muslims who do not see eye to eye with that fringe? How do the Christians remain? It is because I have surely seen the oppression of my people and I have come after hearing their cry to support them, to strengthen them and to be with them. The land of milk and honey is not a land of material prosperity. It is a land of spiritual flourishing. And throughout our history, the Coptic Orthodox Church has made three 
very significant contributions to Christianity and to the world. The first is monasticism. With the great monastic life and monastic orders, starting with St. Anthony the Great, St. Pacomius, St. Shinuti, St. Macarius, all the great fathers of the wilderness. I, I feel a certain warmth. If I'm walking down the street or traveling in an airport and I see a monk, a nun, any celibate from any church, because I feel we have common roots in the deserts of Egypt. We all came from St. Anthony, his example. The great monastic fathers of the West who went to Egypt and lived in the wilderness and came back and wrote their rules. St. Benedict, John Cassian, people who contributed to the Western monastic life. The second is the ecumenical life of the early church. The great fathers, Saint Athanasius, Saint Cyril, people who contributed to the heritage of Christian living until today. The Athanasian Creed, The model of St. Cyril on the Christology and nature of our Lord Jesus Christ. All of these things that are still alive today. The third is martyrdom. Those who have laid down their life. That people like myself can still he be here amongst you today. Because of the whole of Egypt had lost its faith, I wouldn't be here. And 15 million other people wouldn't be here either. The idolatry in Egypt reached ahead in its contemporary history where because of <coughs> corruption, because of greed, People held on to power and they oppressed others. They persecuted, they marginalized, they ostracized. Egypt became fragmented and some will tell you that that was a political tool of past regimes to divide and conquer. But that fragmentation was in itself a tool to explain to others that while fragmented, God would never bless the country. And until those who were in power started to honor and respect and accept numeric minorities, the land would not be blessed. That never stopped Christians in Egypt from witnessing those burdens of history, that persecution never stopped us. I'm only here because so many millions have been here before me because I received my faith, baptized into my church, ministering in my church today. John Foster writes, when the church of God is aroused to its obligation and duties and right faith to claim what Christ has promised, all things whatsoever, a revolution will take place. And that revolution took place. At the beginning of 2011, New Year's Eve, 
we have 3,000 churches in England, uh, in, in, uh, in Egypt. One of those churches, the Church of St. Mark and St. Peter in Alexandria, was conducting midnight prayers and Coptic faithful would go to their parish to celebrate New Year's Eve. 31st of December, 2010. Just after midnight, a bomb erupted in the church and people died just because they decided to go and pray. Until then, there had not been large-scale demonstrations in Egypt. And I've heard this from political commentators who said that the great drive that hit the streets of Cairo in January of 2011, only weeks after that bomb, were inspired by the Coptic faithful who went out into the streets in Alexandria <coughs> in those first days of that same year to call for justice and to explain their displeasure at what had happened. That gave Egypt confidence and going from that point forward, a 30-year regime fell. If you want to make correlations and connections, you can. If you want to say it's coincidence, you can do that too. But we know, as Christians, that there is no such thing as coincidence. For our God is a God of order. And our God is a God of promises that are kept. And the nation of idolatry, bondage, and corruption fell. Christians were in the streets with Muslims. They presented that good example. They were part of that revolution. They contributed. I must confess, I was a skeptic. Because I knew that that revolution in 2011 was premature. It was well-intentioned. But there wasn't the leadership that could take it forward. And a political and security vacuum that ensued actually then allowed for those who would run their own agenda to take over the revolution. We went into elections. How do you take a people who have never voted for a president into elections only months after that? And not only that, you were actually starting from a position of disadvantage. Because you are talking about a country that is approximately 60% in illiteracy, poverty, or both. People who are poor are manipulated by money, and so are therefore are vulnerable. People who are uneducated and literate are manipulated ideologically and particularly through religion and therefore are vulnerable. So you took in a vulnerable electorate that had never voted before with candidates who didn't present any sort of coherent platform or policy and expected them to go and vote. Countries in the West have been doing democracy for centuries, and we still don't always get it right. <laughs> and today is an example of that. <laughs> yeah. 
But that's who we were. We had a president elected. Was it democratic? By textbook standards, yes. There were elections. Some will say that they were corrupt. Some will say that there was financial manipulation or ideological manip manipulation. Some will say that uh, there was tampering. There, have, there was proof that in some sectors there was forgery. But that was two years ago. It's a reality. There was a president who was voted in by an astounding 0.7% majority. And that's considering that it was a 12% mandate. Because out of the population of Egypt, only 50% is eligible to vote. Only 50% of them actually went out to vote. And just over 50% of them actually voted for Mohamed Morsi. And out of those, some voted for Islam because it was a Muslim president who was a member of the Freedom and Justice Party, Muslim Brotherhood, and so therefore he was a righteous man in their eyes who would give them the slogan of al ikhwan the Brotherhood, Al-Islam Hu Al-Hal, Islam is the solution. Some voted anti-Mubarak and anti-Shafi, who was his opponent. Some intentionally went and voided their ballots as an act of protest, and some boycotted the whole procedure. But democracy is democracy. Let's give them a chance. Although the president needed to be a totally independent candidate who was not affiliated to any party and parties were supposed to be political, not religious, we ended up with the president who was a member, continuing member, in act, in deed, in ideology, of a religiously grounded political party. But we still thought, let's give them a chance, because there were promises. We will have a Christian vice president. We'll have a woman vice president. I will be a president for all Egyptians. Of course, politicians don't lie. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> Let's give him a chance. In 12 months, there was nothing done about most of the problems in Egypt, and many of them actually escalated. So towards the end of the presidency of Mohammed Morsi, the stock markets had fallen to a five-year low. Unemployment was up to about 30%. GDP in actual fact had fallen. National debt had risen by 85%. Inflation had risen. Cost of living had risen. There were fuel shortages. There were power cuts. Crime had risen tenfold. Home invasions, abductions, hostage takings. <coughs> But of course, it's democracy. Egyptians should have waited for another three years before they did anything. Ladies and gentlemen, democracy is not an entitlement. Democracy is a responsibility. And democratically elected officials are responsible to act <coughs> responsibly. The people went out into the street. They'd done it only about two years b before. Depending on which news broadcaster you follow, there were between 
1.5 and 33 million people in the streets, which is a small <laughs> discrepancy. <laughs> Sounds like national government statistics. I would be more comfortable with the upper limit of that estimate, whether it's 5, 10, 15, 30 million, million people. They went out into the streets, completely peaceful. And to show you the spirit that was there, there were families out there, people I would never expect to go out in the streets. Mothers, fathers, children, grandparents. One of the funniest things I saw was that during that period, there were lots of, of course, political analysts. And in that time, Egypt generated 80 million political analysts. <laughs> Everybody knew exactly what was going to happen and how and when. And they were convinced that they had the truth. And so there was something called Hezb Kanaba. Okay, the couch party. Because they would sit on their couches at home and they would bring forth all this political wisdom of exactly what should happen and how and when. And so I saw one photograph on that day of the 30th of June where there was a couch brought into the street and there was a sign that saying, even the couch is out. <laughs> That was the sentiment. It was a joyful occasion. People were out saying, this is our country. We have regained our national identity. We have reclaimed our nation and we are not letting it go. No one is going to take it out of our hands again. Up to that point, people saw themselves as first religious and then national. Just after the bombing of that church in Alexandria, a leading figure of the Muslim Brotherhood was asked, do you relate, relate yourself more to your local Egyptian Christian neighbor or to an Indonesian Muslim? And he said, of course it would be an Indonesian Muslim. Because of the concept of Al Ummah, the Islamic nation that binds all together. Now that Islamic nation also marginalizes and rejects other Muslims who don't see eye to eye. And that's why after the uprising, the first attack we saw on a religious minority was not on Christians, but it was the desecration of Sufi shrines. And just before the end of the <coughs> Morsi period, we saw Shiite Muslims killed in the streets of Egypt because they were Shiites. We had leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood standing at the demonstrations in Cairo saying that it was the secularists in Tahrir Square who were the defilement of Egypt because they were not good Muslims. So no one was good enough. Christian, Muslim, secularist, nobody. We got so caught up with the language. Was this a coup? Was it a political, was it a military intervention? <coughs> At the end of the day, it was what it was. It was the people speaking and saying enough is enough. After that, of course, there has to be a scapegoat. There were tragic scenes in Cairo <coughs> as the pro-Morsi demonstrations were dispersed. And as a result, another unprecedented attack took place. 50 churches attacked, burnt, in a space of 48 hours. I 
I was asked on several interviews, was this orchestrated? Do you know who it is? Who did it? Investigating is not my responsibility. What I do call for is a public and a transparent investigation. I would find it very difficult to believe that that was not orchestrated. I would actually be very concerned because it wasn't orchestrated. It would show an even greater disloyalty and failure of a government that let a fragmented community turn into such a polarized community that an eruption of anger could lead to attacks on 50 places of worship simultaneously over 48 hours. So that justification would actually be even a greater condemnation. I spoke about Diocletian. So if we compare what happened in mid-August of this year to what happened during the reign of Diocletian, during what, to, to what happened in the seventh century, it really is very, very little. So that wasn't strange for us, because as I said, I was a skeptic. I knew this would happen. I just thought it would happen much later down the line. What was astounding was the reaction of Christians. Not a single act of retaliation. Not a single act of vengeance. There's a small leaflet that will be handed to you as you leave. And on the back has a beautiful picture. On the front, if you look carefully, there's a picture of people standing and praying. They are praying in the burnt out shell of a church. Because the church is not the building, the church is the people. And where two or three of more, more of, are gathered in my name, I shall be there, be there with you. On the back, a beautiful picture of two young boys praying in the midst of that same church. <coughs> Burnt, a shell, but still a place of worship. That is the resilience of Egypt's Christians. It comes from a long history of preparation. When Pope Toadros was asked, what are you as Christians going to do? He said, nothing. This is our cross, we bear our cross. For he who does not bear his cross cannot be my disciple. He said, this all happened, but as Christians we will not retaliate. In one village, really heartwarming story. In one village, people heard that Islamists were coming to burn the church. So the Muslims went out and said to the Christians, we're going to protect your church and stood in front of it. The Christians went and sent them home and said, doesn't matter. If they destroy the church, we'll build a new one. But we don't want to lose each other. Incredible love from the Muslims. Incredible love from the Christians. Incredible witness. And those stories and those accounts are not rare. And that's why by God's grace, we didn't see in Egypt what we saw in Libya or Syria, in Iraq. The prophets of doom were wrong. There was never going to be a revolution in Egypt. Ever. There was incredible Christian witness. People came out, <coughs> Muslims came out and said, what are you? Who are you? You haven't raised your voice. You haven't screamed. You haven't cried. You haven't went out and to seek vengeance and revenge. On one church there was anti-Christian graffiti against the Pope, 
against our Lord Jesus Christ himself, because that makes a lot of sense, down with Jesus. <laughs> that was offensive. <laughs> Next to it, one of the Christian villagers had written, love your enemy. That is how they lived, and that's how they live until today. <coughs> People paralleled. There was a transition of authority in the church when Pope Shenouda passed away, and there was a process of electing a new Pope. And there was with almost such a grace, such love. Again, the prophets of doom said the church will fall apart. Pope Shenouda has been there for 40 years. Once he goes, that's it. Power struggles, fractions, fractures, nothing. They saw a gracious transfer of power paralleled with the turmoil that came in the choice of a new civil leader. And again, Christ shines in the midst. Egypt is in a good place. I'm coming to reassure you. I'm coming to reassure you that we are hopeful. More hopeful than we have been for years. Because what happened with those churches and those 50 other Christian properties and schools and orphanages that were burnt down just because they were Christian? The Egyptian Bible Society. What happened at that time? Blurred a lot of the lines that were in the, in, the, in the culture. Christian Muslim lines were blurred. Religious secular lines were blurred. People who came onto the streets in June and July were men and women, Christians and Muslims, young and old, religious and secular. But one line that became very clear was radicalism, extremism, fringe elements, and the rest of the society. And that line still stands until today. We grieve the death of every human being, Christian or Muslim or Islamist, <coughs> because a life is a life. And every person is the image and likeness of God, even those who corrupt that image and that likeness. There is still hope for salvation in repentance and confession. Every life is sacred. And every life lost is a tragedy. And every mother grieving is heartbreaking. And every child orphaned is unacceptable. So we grieve them. But we also look forward to a new Egypt. An Egypt that, with a new constitution, a new presence, accepts all, respects all, calls all to a unified justice, holds all accountable while honoring all. That's what it should be. I want to close with this one passage that I think epitomizes the Christians of Egypt but also the Christians of Syria, and we pray for them during these days. I, I am so blessed and glad that you are here to hear about Egypt. But Egypt's okay. Those who are really in need of our prayers these days are our, sister, our Syrian brethren, Christian and Muslim, Alawites, everyone. The destruction seen there is heartbreaking. So we pray for the community. We pray for those who have lost brethren, children, fathers, in Nigeria, in Pakistan, in Kenya. All of those who have lost loved ones, because every life lost is a tragedy. 
St. Paul in his second epistle to the Corinthians reminds us. He says, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life of Jesus also <coughs> may be manifest in our body. The life of Jesus is manifest in our body. The life of Jesus is manifest in Egypt. The life of Jesus is manifest in the Middle East. We pray for them. We pray for the region. We pray for peace in the world. We pray for direction and wisdom and grace. Confident that the God who created us and created the world is the God who reconciles hearts and the God who took flesh and died for humanity is the one who calls us all to oneness with him and rejoices in our response to that oneness. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Thank you, Sayyidah.